I open them up, and I see the guy next to me also with his eyes closed. A pilot who admits falling asleep in the cockpit. And he is not the only one. A lot of pilots fall asleep during the flight. Thousands of pilots are complaining of increasingly poor working conditions. It is uitbuiting. A gevaarlijke mix die een gevaar kan opleveren voor de vliegveiligheid. But the regulator does not see the problem. We are not certain that we have a problem. It's the biggest open secret out there. Zembla investigates what is amiss above the clouds and why we hear so little about it. It's a total blind spot. It's a frighteningly dangerous blind spot. I call it a mafia organization. There is an omerta. If you speak, you die. For months, we conduct interviews with pilots and cabin crew. They work for so-called low-cost carriers, the airlines that transport us all over Europe at bargain prices. Our sources will only talk to us after we promise to keep them anonymous, including their voices. Well, because I'm going to face consequences, of course, and I'm really afraid of what they might do. Not limited to termination or even legal proceedings against me. I know they've been in the past very hard on people that did disclose any information. The company is powerful enough to use all their resources to destroy your career presently and future-wise, and maybe even the past. Intimidation. This comes as no surprise to the heads of the pilot and aircrew unions. Eigenlijk uh, wordt verwacht dat jij als werknemer, als piloot, gewoon je mond houdt en exact doet wat de maatschappij wil. Ja, ook wij krijgen uh, anonieme meldingen of uh, we krijgen meldingen van uh, piloten die zeggen dit en dit is mijn ervaring, maar alsjeblieft uh, gebruik niet mijn voorbeeld met naam en toenaam. Dat is een hele trieste zaak. En wat mij dat zegt is dat deze mensen vrezen voor hun baan, omdat op het moment dat ze wel uh, herkenbaar in beeld komen, uh, ze die baan kwijt zijn. I am fearing retaliation from my company if I do disclose my name. Pilots who are afraid to speak up. This was highlighted a decade ago in the documentary Mayday Mayday. Mayday, Mayday. Exposing malpractices at the Irish low cost airline Ryanair. I'm afraid of losing my job. I'm afraid of losing my job. For my goodness. Er heerste destijds een cultuur van, ja, omschrijf het maar als een soort angstcultuur. Evert van Zwol flies for KLM. He was also president of the Dutch Pilots Association at the time. Mensen waren bang om dingen te melden en ze waren heel voorzichtig. En dat was ik vanuit mijn eigen achtergrond helemaal niet gewend. Dus ik, ik vond dat raar en ik vond dat ook, ja, ik vond dat op zich ook best wel een gevaarlijke situatie because pilots were under pressure to make decisions they did not support. There is pressure put on crews to take as little fuel as possible to save money for the company. Pilots often operated flights with less fuel than they wanted to cut costs. As a result, one evening in Valencia, three aircraft ran into trouble in rapid succession. Valencia, Mayday, Mayday, Sierra, Nine, Victor, Romeo, Low, and Fuel. When there is a mayday in the tower, everybody gets uh, alert. And this was not normal. This was a very a potential dangerous situation. Furthermore, pilots admitted that they sometimes operated the controls when they were not physically fit to fly. Did you ever fly while sick? No comments. Yes. Yes, we did. The revelations prompted Evert von Zwoll and a couple of international colleagues to set up a union specifically for Ryanair pilots. Was Ryanair blij met dat initiatief? Niet zo blij. Nee, we zijn er behoorlijk tegen gewerkt. Van Zwoll and his colleagues were sued for defamation and slander when they criticized Ryanair. 28 zittingsdagen, volle dagen, van dinsdag tot en met vrijdag in de High Court in Dublin gezeten met uh, vier advocaten aan onze kant en een veelvoud daarvan aan de kant van Ryanair. Ja, dat, dat, is, dat is gewoon heel bedreigend en intimiderend. Het was ook gericht tegen ons persoonlijk, dus niet uh, als organisatie of als functionaris van de organisatie, maar echt tegen mij en nog twee andere collega's persoonlijk gericht. 
after a six-year lawsuit, the founders of the Ryanair pilot group win the case on all counts. Het is het uiteindelijk waard geweest, ja. Uh, zeg ik aarzelend er wel bij, want het is ook wel een, uh, ja, wat ik eerder zei, een moeilijke tijd uh, geweest. En, uh, uh, maar uiteindelijk uh, zou ik het uh, weer doen? Uh, ja, het antwoord op die vraag zou ja zijn. But has the legal position of aircrew improved in the past 10 years? Nothing has changed. Says Jack, not his real name one of the sources from 10 years ago. He no longer flies for Ryanair, but works as a freelancer for another airline. I did see and witness pilots, individuals being pushed aside or bullied or fired or terminated as they say. It is a risk to openly talk about the airline business from within nowadays. We speak to dozens of pilots and cabin crew of the budget airlines. However, we encounter significant reluctance. It's not something that the employers, um, the companies, the airlines like to see, you know, to have people openly talking about their business to the media. This point in time, better not to raise your head too much above the surface. And so it would seem, only 11 sources allow us to broadcast their interviews. We determine their identity and their employer on the condition that we do not mention the employer's name. If my airline would um, find out about this, I would be fired. They wouldn't give me any recommendation letter, and it would be quite hard to get certification of the hours that I was actually employed with them and any other papers regarding my training. I call it a mafia organization which is disguised as an airline. If you see the Gomorrah in Italy or whatever, or in Sicily, you have the other ones. There is an omerta. If you speak, you die. I would face a big wall which will then affect the future of my career. I will be blacklisted in aviation forever. I'm not saying they're killing people, but they must be silenced in administrative ways or, you know, in financial ways or so on. Reprisals, like the sword of Damocles, the threat keeps them silent. With one exception, Mike Simpkins. Why did you go public? Well, because it's my duty. It's my duty to raise him. He was a pilot with the now bankrupt Thomas Cook and has written several books about his experiences. When you make a stand when you've got a job, um, that's a big step, but I decided I had to. His books about the dark side of the aviation industry have garnered widespread attention. Simple fact is, been inundated since the book came out um, by pilots and cabin crew informing the uh, situations, similar situations they found themselves in. I think the fact that these other pilots, probably in this documentary, um, are not prepared to appear without uh, disguising the voice and the face tells you everything you need to know about the current state of the situation in uh, the aviation industry. I don't have any job security because it means they can put you on the street from one day to another without having to justify themselves. And as you don't have any legal support in any country, they can do whatever they want. It is difficult for aircrew to assert themselves due to their vulnerable legal position. A quarter of our sources have so-called atypical contracts. That's a verzamel name for all contracts that are not standard contracts. Hein? Meike Hauerzeil is a professor of labor law. She reviews our sources' contracts and identifies the anomalies in the atypical employment agreements. Baanonzekerheid, geen ontslagbescherming of heel weinig. Maar ook heb je vaak uh, een lagere beloning of lagere of andere secundaire voorwaarden. En ja, je, sta, je staat meer onder druk waarschijnlijk door het feit dat je die onzekerheid ervaart. Dat op zijn minst. En waar moet je dan aan denken? De, dat zit hem in. Um, uh, piloten die worden ingehuurd via een tussenpersoon, als een soort van ZZP'er, maar tegelijkertijd verboden worden om voor een andere maatschappij te vliegen. It's a take it or leave it type of scenario. So this is what we have to offer. If you don't like it, you have no job. Het komt voor in een vorm waarin vliegers uh, beschikbaar moeten zijn, de volledige maand om te vliegen, maar geen garantie hebben dat ze verluchten zullen maken en als ze niet vliegen, ook niet betaald zullen worden. You only get paid for the hours you work. 
If you're a day sick, you don't get paid. If they wake up one day and they want to cancel everything and kick me out or modify my conditions, they can do it. Als mensen onzeker zijn over hun rechtspositie, dan wordt het voor die mensen ook heel erg lastig om aan de bel te trekken op het moment dat zich iets voordoet wat de vliegveiligheid in gevaar zou kunnen brengen. Uh, en in de luchtvaart zitten we in een meldingscultuur. Mensen worden geacht te melden als ze uh, iets meemaken wat de vliegveiligheid in gevaar kan brengen. Dit soort constructies ja, die horen wel meer bij absoluut aan de minimumkant van arbeidsvoorwaarden opererende uh, bedrijven. Dus ja, dit is zeker zorgelijk. Pilots already pointed out the atypical employment contracts 10 years ago. It's part of this, this, this structure they build. Um, if you don't fly, you don't get paid. Wat is er sinds toen dan verbeterd? Nou, er is weinig verbeterd. Uh, um, uh, en eigenlijk zou je wel kunnen zeggen dat het op aspecten uh, erger is geworden. Um, het is als een olievlek verspreid naar meerdere luchtvaartmaatschappijen. So the number of atypical contracts in the aviation industry is increasing. And that is surprising, because according to experts, poor working conditions have a direct impact on flight safety. Dan geef ik graag het woord aan de heer Jorgens. Dank u wel, ook voor de uitnodiging. A hearing in the Dutch parliament. The speaker is Yves Jorgens, professor of European social law and social criminal law at Ghent University. En daar merken we toch wel eigenlijk op dat piloten sterk onder druk staan. Sommigen die zeggen, ja, als ik twee keer ziek ben, dan word ik al bij de management geroepen om te zeggen, ik zou toch de volgende keer vliegen. Of de... A year after the revelations about Ryanair, Jornens and his team interviewed over 6.500 pilots. Ik wil alleen maar op zeggen dat er denk ik noodzaak is om rekening te houden met de invloed van arbeidsomstandigheden en het shame and blame en management cultuur op de luchtvaart. Want dat heeft een impact op de veiligheid. Zeer verontrustend. De arbeidsomstandigheden um, die zijn gekoppeld aan, aan de contracten. En um, dat samen met de bepaalde angstcultuur die, die heerst bij luchtvaartmaatschappijen... Uh, maken eigenlijk een, een, een gevaarlijke mix die een uh, gevaar kan opleveren voor de vliegveiligheid. In mijn airline maak je een rapport en ze zullen niet het probleem zien. Maar ze zullen zien waar je een fout hebt gemaakt. They will come and accuse you of making a mistake rather than trying to find a source of the report. And that's totally no just culture. De luchtvaart staat bekend om zijn just culture. Wat is dat? Dat is uh, de, de cultuur die eigenlijk in een, die bij een luchtvaartmaatschappij moet, moet zijn, waarbij mensen fouten kunnen maken. En uh, de luchtvaartmaatschappij bereid is om van die fouten te leren en daar verbeteringen uh, op aan te brengen. Dat vraagt dat je je werknemers de veiligheid biedt om uh, frank en vrij te vertellen uh, dat ze die fout gemaakt hebben en waarom zij denken dat, dat ze dat gedaan hebben. Uh, je stimuleert ze eigenlijk om dat te doen? Ja, je stimuleert ze om zeg maar zeggen, te, te praten over de fouten die ze zelf gemaakt hebben. Als je die veiligheid, die veilige cultuur niet biedt, uh, dan houden mensen hun mond. Flight crew that do not report when things go wrong. Because as employees, they have been forced into silence. Or as one pilot sums it up. You do your job as they say, you go from A to B. You're just a puppet. A puppet on a string. The atypical contracts are a thorn in the side of unions and interest groups representing pilots and cabin crew. Het zijn veel al uh, low-cost maatschappijen die dat doen, maar het is zeker niet gezegd dat alle low-cost maatschappijen er gebruik van maken. Maar je hebt de echte cowboys in de luchtvaart die, uh, die de weg wel afsnijden en de, en de gaten in de wet opzoeken. En uh, het komt dus uh, wel bij uh, één op de vijf uh, verkeersvliegers in Europa voor dat er een atypische contractvorm uh, is. Welke vliegtuigmaatschappijen werken met dat soort contracten? Er zijn in Europa een heleboel. Um, de twee de grootste maatschappijen die, die we kennen, dat zijn Wizz Air en, en Ryanair. It's a very convenient setup for the airlines. They don't have any direct responsibility on the pilots. They simply sign a contract with an agency. The agency provides these people to the airline. The name of my airline is mentioned nowhere in my contract. And I have no taxes, no social security and nothing of all this sort. 
Er is maar één reden en dat is geld besparen. Het heeft commerciële doelen. Deze maatschappijen ontlopen uh, op alle mogelijke manieren het betalen van belastingen, het verantwoordelijk zijn voor hun personeel. Um, de, uh, de maatschappijen die dit, die dit gebruiken doen dat eigenlijk alleen maar om die reden. Officially, it looks like a real self-employment, but it's actually a constant service that you provide to one specific airline for years and years, and they regulate your life. Dat is per definitie uh, een schijnaanstelling uh, als ZZP. Want deze mensen vliegen alleen maar voor die maatschappij. Nou, je hoeft alleen maar naar de definitie van ZZP te kijken om te weten dat dat dus gewoon, ja, wij noemen dat dan bogus is, dat het gewoon nep is. For example, in Italy or in the Netherlands or in Germany or in France, they don't allow anymore the contractors concept. However. If an Italian or a German or a Dutch person or a Frenchman works in another base, they allow it. But that means that still this person falls outside any law. I have seen people being raided by the police, by the financial departments, looking for, for their taxes or whatever. Where do you have your money and where do you pay taxes? What is your social security? So I've seen people with huge fines. In my case, I cannot even go to the local law because the local law doesn't apply. Even though I pay mandatory tax there, social insurance and have everything arranged. And when the problems arise, I find myself in a financial difficult situation without being able to turn to any law within the whole of Europe. And we are in 2023. Je hebt een luchtvaartmaatschappij die heeft uh, haar uh, hoofdkantoor in Spanje. Uh, die is zelf gevestigd in Ierland. En de vliegtuigen zijn geregistreerd in Malta. Dat doe je niet omdat je het leuk vindt, maar dat doe je puur om gebruik te maken van de, de zwakke schakels in de Europese wetgeving. En dus jouw, uh, ja, jouw, jouw kosten zo laag mogelijk te houden. Het is uitbuiting. Het, het, het zorgt ervoor dat mensen hun recht niet kunnen halen. Dat mensen niet fatsoenlijk uh, worden uh, behandeld. En dat mensen op straat staan zodra ze ook maar iets doen wat de maatschappij onwelgevallig is. De opkomst van uh, atypische contracten. Uh, nul uren contracten, schijnzelfstandigheid, uh, brievenbusfirma's, dat is, een, uh, dat is een groot probleem en dat, is, uh, dat zit in de lift helaas in de luchtvaart. Ja, dat, dat is zeker zo, omdat die maatschappijen explosief zijn gegroeid. Die bieden uh, vluchten aan tegen extreem lage prijzen en daar is heel veel vraag naar. Het begint alweer een vertrouwd beeld te worden in drukke vakantieperiodes. The pandemic, the rapidly rising temperatures. De zomer van 2022 is tot nu toe de warmste zomer ooit gemeten in Europa. Naar verwachting wordt juli wereldwijd de warmste maand die ooit werd gemeten. The melting polar ice. De oceanen zijn op sommige plekken 5 graden warmer dan normaal. And the global forest fires. The era of global warming has ended. The era of global boiling has arrived. Do not stop us from flying. Wat dacht u toen u aankwam? Uh, lekker druk. Nor do the protests appear to be making any difference. We are flying almost as much as before the COVID crisis. And Ryanair, low fares, great care. It costs next to nothing. Escape to these incredible destinations from 25.99. Ja, ja. Kijk. Iedereen weet dat je voor 59 euro niet naar Barcelona kan vliegen. En toch kan het. En dan, is, dan weten we dus ook dat er maar, dat, wie het slachtoffer daarvan is. En dat is het personeel. Want het vliegtuig kost wat het kost. De brandstof kost wat het kost. De landingsrechten zijn wat ze zijn. En dus het enige waar ze nog op kunnen wringen, dat is het personeel. And that is what happens with inevitable consequences. As far back as 2014... Yves Jorens was the first researcher to establish a link between poor working conditions and flight safety. Want dat heeft een impact op de veiligheid. In the years that followed, other universities did the same. Such as the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. They came to the same conclusion. If you're afraid of speaking up or if you're afraid to, for example, say that you're not feeling well or that you're sick, have to take time off work, then we have a result where, where the pilots start flying despite not feeling well. Her latest research has just been completed 
and has not yet been published. She interviewed 10,000 aircrew staff, and the same picture emerged. According to 66% of pilots and 80% of cabin crew, working conditions have actually deteriorated. We were quite um, sad, uh, I would say, to see that the working conditions had uh, deteriorated even further. No less than 29% of cabin crew and 36% of pilots report that safety is also deteriorating. If you are under pressure, if you are feeling stressed, if you are fatigued, of course, it affects your cognitive functioning and again, it affects, of course, flight safety. If you are a bit slower in your decision making, if you're not that attentive or you have the same clear perception and so forth. So it has lots of uh, consequences. Your abilities are degraded. You feel not operating in a safe manner. It is a kind of form of instinct of survival rather than being comfortably installed. Our sources confirm that they too sometimes have to fight the urge to sleep in the cockpit. You pray that nothing seriously goes wrong because you know in this state you will not be able to maybe get a safe outcome. Your mental or your physical faculties are reduced because you're too tired. A lot of pilots fall asleep during the flight. I found myself falling asleep during the flight. We call them micro-sleeps. Well, it was maybe five minutes. We were towards the descent, but not yet descending. And a few minutes later, the cabin crew came in to just check on us and asked if we wanted something. And when she rang at the door, I woke up. Suddenly you wake up and say, well, what happened? Maybe it was for a few seconds, but it's really an awakening call. When you drive a car, you can pull over and park and then sleep for 20 minutes and then go again. On a plane, it's different. I had one case. It was very late at night and we just kind of dozed off. And all of a sudden, I realized my eyes were closed. I opened them up and I see the guy next to me also with his eyes closed. If your working conditions sort of pressurizes you or push you to do things, you will do it. So we're, it's, we are very dependent on the conditions in our context and we act accordingly to these uh, conditions. And if you, for example, then are afraid of if you have an, an, a typical employment, you're afraid of losing your job, um, you're afraid of pay cuts or whatever, of course, then you you try to go to work despite, you know, you shouldn't perhaps. Je moet een uh, vlieger, een verkeersvlieger in de cockpit hebben die veiligheid bovenaan kan zetten en die die afweging eigenlijk zonder last en rugspraak kan maken. En contracten die dat dwarsbomen, die moeten verboden worden in onze ogen. Wie zou daar tegen moeten optreden? Nou, ik denk dat dat uiteindelijk de overheid moet zijn. Welke? Uh, de Europese overheid zou eigenlijk als eerste denk ik daar de kaders voor moeten stellen. En we Waar, hebben... Waarom gebeurt dat niet? Ja, omdat er sommige landen zijn die bijvoorbeeld belang hechten aan uh, prijsvechters... omdat ze bijvoorbeeld in hun land gevestigd zijn. Dus landen hebben verschillende belangen. Europa is verdeeld. Ja, Europa is verdeeld, absoluut. We go to Brussels, where 27 member states ensure that bureaucratic wheels turn slowly. To the frustration of members of parliament like Claire Daly, who has been investigating the issue for years. I think it comes back ultimately to the European Commission. They need to look at the facts and figures on this. They need to link the fact that atypical forms of, of employment are directly impacting on safety. European Commissioner for Transport, Valian, is responsible for aviation in Europe. We request an interview, but she declines. Two weeks ago, my colleague sent you a uh, request for an interview. Can you tell me why uh, Ms. Valian is not willing to answer our questions? Uh, as far as I recall, I did send you an email after that. And it was because the dates you suggested were dates where she was really on, not even in town. Okay, we can change the date to any place and anywhere uh, Ms. Valian is uh, comfortable with. So would you be so kind to reconsider that request? I need to see exactly 
exactly what kind of questions we're getting. Um, that's just how it's going. It's the biggest open secret out there. This is a disaster waiting to happen, and I mean, you flagged it 10 years ago. It's a miracle that there hasn't been uh, a tr uh, really horrific incidents before now, but how long can they wing it, as it were? 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. We discover how some airlines put pressure on their staff when we gain access to recent audio recordings. In the recordings, we hear how an employer fails to take their pilot seriously when he says he is fatigued and cannot go on. There are thunderstorms around. We were avoiding all day. We've been sitting waiting on an airplane for more than an hour in 40 degree heat. We were expecting another crew to be ready here to fly us back to the home. Just go and have five minutes. Have a bite to eat, have a coffee. Sorry, I am not following your train of thoughts. You want us to go have a coffee and get a bite to eat. And then? The airline always stands by the, if you are unfit to fly, you should not fly. That's written in the manuals. But that's on paper. This is not negotiable. If someone is telling you it's not fit to continue, that's the end of the conversation. Or it should be in theory. In feite zijn mensen verplicht om zich not fit to fly te melden. Dat is dan de term. Um, alleen als je zeker weet dat je daarmee je baan kwijtraakt dan wordt dat een hele moeilijke keus, want ja, ik bedoel, er moet toch ook brood op de plank komen. In mijn company there is a taboo around calling fatigue, because everyone knows if you call fatigue there will be an investigation. What we see is that when someone claims that it's unfit to fly, then there are always consequences, always. There is always a phone call, a letter inviting for a disciplinary meeting. They will try to find why you call fatigue, and they will try to find reasons outside of the company like family life, and they'll blame it on that. And they will give you a warning, like if this happens again, there will be measures taken. We jakkeren mensen af en brengen ze in gewetensnood, want deze mensen weten allemaal dat ze zich not fit to fly moeten melden. That is where former pilot Mike Simpkins drew the line. I just knew I was too tired to operate. I can tell you how tired. I knew it was way, way beyond um, being safe. So that's why I refused. He gets suspended, although Simpkins insists it would have been irresponsible to keep flying. The level of fatigue was equivalent to uh, effectiveness of a drunk driver. Um, 0.08 mil of blood alcohol content. So it would have been the equivalent of flying, at, um, the equivalent of being drunk. How dangerous was it to keep on flying then, with this level of fatigue? Uh, well, not only dangerous, it also would be criminal, and that was pointed out at the trial. Simpkins contests his suspension in court, and the judge rules in his favour. The judge said, if I had operated that day, she agreed that um, the consideration it would have been a criminal act to fly when fatigued, that so fatigued that it would uh, result in uh, safety issues. Criminal, yet our sources admit that they are often in the cockpit when they are unfit to fly. It's absolutely shocking, but I'm not surprised. I've had an awful lot of testimony myself uh, over the years from pilots in a similar situation. Captains worried that their co-pilot is coughing and sneezing and spluttering, but won't go home because if he goes home, he won't get paid. If I say it's normal, that's probably overstating it, but it's certainly not uncommon. We also want to submit these findings to European Commission of Valium. But after persistent requests, she eventually informs us that she does not wish to respond on camera. We would really be unpleasantly surprised if nobody would answer serious questions about flight safety in Europe. I cannot guarantee you that it will be the Commissioner answering, but I can do guarantee you that you will get answers. All right. If there are questions that are but like under our remit, so you will get answers. I think that's really disappointing because we have a European Commission that talks repeatedly about transparency, about openness, about accountability to the European citizen. These people have an obligation to answer the public via your programme or others. You're supposed to be representing the citizens of Europe. Well, tell the citizens of Europe about your work. Account for your actions.
In the end, European Commissioner Valian refers us for an interview to EASA, the European Regulator for Aviation Safety. It is noteworthy that for years the organization has cast doubt on scientific studies into the effects of the atypical contracts. Now, that a, a pilot who is uh, self-employed feels less secure in terms of employment uh, than uh, a pilot who is uh, a traditional employee, that's for sure. Uh, how do you translate that into uh, a safety risk? Uh, it's a perception. I have a hard time understanding it um, because um, the perception, I mean, that's the way we perceive the world. Um, if I'm unhappy, that's the way I perceive something. If I'm in pain, that's the way I perceive my pain. So reducing perception to something that shouldn't be listened to, I, I really don't understand that. That's not a perception. They've seen it happen to their colleagues. It's a reality. So this is just a cop-out on IASA's part, and it's really not good enough. Yeah, it's the pilots, and, and how else could we measure? Aren't they the ones in the position? So who knows best whether a pilot is tired? Only that pilot. Nobody else can adjudicate on that. It's very much a personal matter. Executive Director Key has since left the supervisory agency. A week before this program aired, and following over a month of calls and emails, IASA finally agrees to an interview, remotely, with another director. In your opinion, is there a connection between atypical contracts and flight safety? Well, in fact, we don't see a correlation between uh, whatever form of uh, employment conditions and uh, and safety. We don't see it in the in the in the data in the safety data. Er liggen stapels rapporten over de manco's en over de afhankelijkheid. En als EASA dezelfde rapporten zou lezen als dat wij lezen, dan zouden ze tot dezelfde conclusie moeten komen als wij. Zij zeggen het is vooral de perceptie van piloten. Dit heeft helemaal niets met perceptie te maken. If flying personnel by the thousands since 2014 tell you that their contracts are a risk to flight safety, how come that doesn't convince you? Well, I mean, we, we uh, the whole issue of employment, and so it's not only safety, it's also uh, a, a struggle between the uh, employer, the airlines and the personnel. Uh, so there can be a lot of uh, factors uh, influencing that people are not fully happy where... Uh, no, but we're, we're not talking about fully happy, we're talking about safety. And pilots do tell us, and not only pilots, also scientists and union uh, leaders, tell us there is a big risk as a result of these contracts. There is a hazard, there is a potential risk. That's true, and that's why we issue so, safety. Sorry to interrupt, but so you uh, acknowledge there is a hazard, right? There is a hazard, yes, uh, because that could lead to some safety risk. We have to look at what is being reported. So that has not that is not what the data suggests that there should be a particular issue, concrete safety risk with these contracts. So there is no way that, you can you, there is no way you can tackle this problem. Is that what you're saying? Well, 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 no, what I'm saying is that we are not certain that we have a problem. It's a total blind spot. It's a frighteningly dangerous blind spot. And it comes back to our earlier point that the longer this goes on, it doesn't mean that actually there's no problem. It means that the problem is getting worse. In an EASA annual report, we see that the organization gets two thirds of its funding from the aviation industry aircraft manufacturers, airports and airlines. Dat zijn hun stakeholders, zoals ze dat noemen. De mensen die zij uh, in hun belangensfeer hebben zitten om mee te praten over uh, wat er wel en wat er niet uh, geregeld moet worden op het gebied van vliegveiligheid. Maar daarmee uh, zijn zij ook niet objectief meer. Nee, ik denk dat dat niet wenselijk is. How independent would you say EASA is? We consider ourselves and we are indeed an independent agency. We are never influenced uh, uh, by any concrete payment going into our house in, a, in a, through another channel. So if we say no, if we give findings, we do that on the basis of a, a technical view on safety and not, we don't earn any money 
on, on, on this. This is to cover our costs. EASA regulates Europe's national inspection agencies. But the watchdog also has a direct contract to oversee the flight safety of Wizz Air, the Hungarian budget airline. We are not compromised by having any customers. We have many manufacturers, Airbus, Dassault, and so on. We have now also as a, as a new uh, element, also airlines. Uh, we have a couple of airlines uh, where we are competent authority that will not compromise our independence. But internal Wizz Air emails that we've obtained show that the budget airline is informed in advance when EASA is going to carry out inspections. We read that the EASA audit will take place between the 5th and the 8th of September. In general, do you announce uh, planned safety audits? Sometimes we do, uh, but that's more for practical reasons that we need uh, some people to be uh, uh, on site when we arrive. Oh, but um, if you do, what are the odds you think your personnel will find any irregularities? Well, when we announce an audit, that is mostly for practical reasons, as I said, and they cannot, they don't have a chance in an airline that to in influence whom we are going to, uh, to, uh, to talk with, because it's our choosing whether we would go to one group of pilots or another group of pilots. So, so there we feel quite confident that what they say to us without the presence of the airline in the room is what they really feel and mean. The email further states, please be prepared to be asked safety-related questions by the auditors. So you don't see that as, as a problem? No, no. Well, it means they're not independent, doesn't it? He who pays the piper, uh, you know, it's the tune you play. When somebody finances you, you're going to give them the answers that they want to hear. Wizz Air is the fastest growing low-cost carrier in Europe. This is the CEO, Josef Faradi, in good spirits, in a newly purchased Airbus. But in an internal video message that we have acquired, his cheerful demeanor seems to have disappeared. He makes it clear to his personnel that they should not make such a big deal out of fatigue. We cannot run this business when uh, every fifth person um, on the base reports sickness because uh, the person is uh, is, is fatigued. Uh, uh, we are all fatigued, but sometimes uh, it, it is required to, uh, to take the extra life. Our sources, pilots and cabin crew, are astonished by the video. I could expect that sort of opinion from somebody who's not working in a highly critical environment like aviation. A person who makes that kind of statement is not concerned about the safety of his personnel. The only thing that matters is the planes take off and land so money can continue to come in. Well, I thought that this is very, very stupid. You cannot say that. If he was my CEO, I would think that he doesn't care about the people he hires. And the only thing he cares about is to fly as much, with little resources, and earn as much money as he possibly could. Nou, dat vond ik heel schokkend, uh, juist omdat fatigue zo'n belangrijk onder, onderwerp is. Het wordt door de wetgever wordt het, um, wordt het echt benoemd als, als een veiligheidsissue, waar we heel zorgvuldig om moeten gaan met elkaar. En daar wordt gewoon gezegd, fatigue, wat is fatigue? Ga maar gewoon, uh, ga maar gewoon vliegen. This is behavior of people who consider themselves next to God. I don't think that they have to be allowed to take any decisions concerning human lives and everything. In my opinion, it's very dangerous. We're not selling potatoes, with all due respect for whoever sells potatoes. If we are fatigued, it becomes a safety concern. It's a risk. We are supposed to mitigate risk. So if you're tired and fatigued, you don't mitigate risk by going the extra mile. It is exactly the opposite. You should do one mile less. And hearing these things from a CEO, it's quite worrying, to be honest. We were quite surprised. Uh, now we don't know the full context of the, the video. Do you consider such a video, do you consider it a safety hazard? No, the video in itself is not a safety hazard, but uh, uh, we, we were not. We were, were not fully uh, uh, in line with that uh, video and the message could be interpreted in the wrong way. Zou u een publieke veroordeling van zo'n boodschap van de EASA verwachten? 
Ja, dat zouden ze zeker moeten doen. We hebben discussed this also with the with the senior management. Why didn't you do that publicly? When we are not fully happy with something, we communicate that directly to uh, to the organization. In this case, with them. Wat vindt u ervan dat zo'n statement uitblijft? Ja, dat vind ik een slechte zaak. En daarmee neem je je verantwoordelijkheid niet. We obtain another noteworthy internal Wizz Air video, in which Faradi answers questions from his staff. A few years ago, some cabin crew created a union in Bucharest. They finally get uh, fired. Uh, what is the European Union about employees' union? I think the same would happen this time as well. Um, I uh, would certainly not recommend you to, uh, to do that. I think we need to do better than that. Um, unions are dragging feet down. Uh, they are distractive. Uh, and, you know, people may think that uh, unions protect them better, but believe me, that is not the case. It triggers an outcry in the United States. The American government denies Wizz Air permission to operate cargo flights to the U.S. The National Pilots Association supports the refusal. From a studio near Washington, its president explains why. Well, Alpa has several concerns with the way Wizz Air operates. It is an anti-union air carrier whose toxic culture raises labor and safety concerns. Wizz Air targets pilots for termination who call in fatigued, call in sick, who will not fly on days off and will not extend their maximum duty days. So what does that tell you? Well, the Wizz Air CEO publicly showed contempt for pilots who refuse to fly when fatigued, saying in a video that everyone was tired and that pilots should just get over it. They refuse to give that license so they from across the Atlantic can see what our people here can't see. Um, that has to tell you something, that our, our oversight bodies are captured, our commission is asleep at the wheel, and passengers in Europe should be worried about that. The Americans also question the role of EASA, which, as we determined, directly oversees safety at Wizz Air. EASA is used to oversee the overseers, overseeing national government aviation safety authorities, but not being the direct supervisor of an airline. EASA is inexperienced at direct safety oversight. We have additional concerns that safety issues will not effectively be addressed. How painful is such a disqualification? Well, uh, I'm quite sure that the Americans are not, uh, are not uh, questioning the quality of the ASA oversight. They but do. Basic... They do. We have spoken to them and they do. Now, the Americans have a problem with that because their rules are formulated in a, in a very strict and perhaps old-fashioned way. I believe they are. Uh, they are about to change the rules, in fact, to accommodate uh, also EASA rules in the future. That's what the latest we have uh, heard from our American partners. So the problem is with strict and old-fashioned rules in the U.S.? That's what they told us. Uh, whether they uh, tell you something else, that's uh, on, on, on their account. In June this year, IASA organizes a conference in Cologne. There is one notable speaker, Wizz Air CEO Faradi. He delivers the opening speech about safety. We are very committed to safety, he says. It is puzzling that an aviation safety organization would invite someone with his track record to be a keynote speaker. But we don't... Uh, you think uh, it's appropriate? We consider Wizz Air and other uh, airlines in Europe uh, as safe airline. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, any representative of that uh, airline can also uh, do presentations at the EASA uh, seminars or, or conferences. Here we have a system where the body responsible for European aviation safety has this airline under its direct charge and only that one. Its CEO is the most blatant advocator of breaching pilot safety regulators and they not only don't sanction him but invite him as their guest speaker to their conference. Our sources also appear to have little confidence in EASA's oversight. You file a report about things and nothing happens. So there is no feedback from the authorities towards the company. So the company can continue behaving like that in impunity. I have filed reports on the EASA system. They just disappear. Even if you ask follow-up emails, you quote your reference number, 
those follow-up emails disappear. It just tells us that we are on our own. I guess in their eyes, they must be doing a good job when there are no fatal accidents. Which is also kind of concerning, because normally aviation should be proactive. It shouldn't be reactive. We should not be waiting for an accident to happen and then make changes. Even when severe issues, safety issues are put under their nose, they don't always want to see them. They turn the other way. Dat is ook een hele slechte zaak, denk ik. En dat, is, dat vind ik dan ook een beetje in het licht staan van het feit dat EASA zegt... we hebben geen data. Ja, als, je, als, je, als er al iemand durft te melden uh, en je doet daar niks mee... Ja, dan, dan, ben je, dan ben je toch niet met veiligheid bezig. Terwijl zij zijn de guru van de veiligheid in Europa. Ik hoop really echt dat EASA de the watchdog die ze moeten zijn. I'm not saying aviation is unsafe at the moment, but there is no oversight. It's too easy for an airline to not be safe. Betekent dat dat het onafhankelijke toezicht op de Europese luchtvaartveiligheid tekort schiet? Het schiet zeker tekort. Ja, die schiet tekort. Hoe ernstig is dat? Dat is ernstig. We interviewed both pilots and cabin crew. No one we spoke to has any confidence in the way EASA conducts oversight. What are your plans to restore that trust? Well, this is not an information that uh, we have that uh, our uh, oversight uh, program is uh, questioned. Uh, we believe we do a professional job. I would believe there is no question, there is no reason to question EASA's independence, independency and professionalism in terms of safety oversight. So finally, Does the public have to be concerned about flight safety in Europe? No, is the short answer.